Hello, anatomy friends. This is Dr. Alsup, and we are going to begin our discussion of the regional anatomy or musculoskeletal anatomy. And we are going to start superiorly and make our way inferiorly. So when we say we start superiorly, we are obviously going to start with the head. So we'll start talking about bones, then we'll talk joints, then we'll talk muscles and kind of uh, think about them uh, as one kind of complex. And we're going to start with uh, the neurocranium, because we really need to kind of break up the bones because there's quite a bit. So we'll talk about what the cranium is, how it's different from the skull, and what are the components. And then we're going to talk through the, the bones of the neurocranium and talk about some of the specific bony landmarks that we want you to identify. Okay, so when we're talking about the cranium, so this term right here, it does not equal the skull. All right, that is one thing I want you to note here. The cranium or the crania is everything but the mandible. The mandible is going to be kind of its own thing. But when you add the mandible back in to the cranium, then, then you have the skull. So the skull is the cranium plus the mandible, and the cranium is everything else. Now, the mandible is cons considered part of the facial bones, and so the facial skeleton, um, fancily, is referred to as the viscerocranium, and the neurocranium is going to be the bony case of the brain. So basically, these are the bones that are protecting the brain. You'll have the calvaria, which is kind of this, the kind of the skull cap. You may have heard it kind of colloquially referred to as that, so this would be the calvaria, and then the basocranium is going to be more of the cranial base of what the brain sits in. So basic cranium is where the brain sits, and then the calvaria kind of goes on top for the additional superior protection. So we're going to focus on the neurocranium in this particular lecture, and the bones of the neurocranium. Starting with the most anterior, which is the frontal bone. And for each one of these, I'll have a little number right next to it. This number indicates if this bone is paired or unpaired. And so when we're talking about adults, the frontal bone is unpaired, so there's only one of them. But uh, in the juvenile period, this was actually two different bones, and there was a suture that kind of ran right down this area. And that was referred to as the frontal suture. Sometimes there's remnants of this suture, and we may see some of examples of that in, in the lab component. Um, so you may have a remnant of that frontal suture that persists into adulthood, and that is called the metopic suture. And that's not a pathology, it's not a fracture, it's just a remnant of the suture. You can also see the frontal bone when you're looking at the base of the cranium. So this is a view of the basocranium, so where that brain is sitting down. So what happened is the calvaria, or the skull cap, was removed in order, and you're looking down into the, the cranium. So that's what this view is here. We will return to this view over and over again, particularly when we're talking about the neurocranium, because a lot of these bones are, um, we're going to discuss some of these bones. So the frontal bone you can see here shaded in blue. One thing I want to note too, if you're looking at this anterior view, is that uh, the, the frontal bone, the squamous portion, is really making up what we think of as the forehead region. So that frontal lobe of the cerebrum is sitting uh, just behind that. The supraorbital margin is going to be kind of this boundary between the orbital parts and the squamous parts. So I think kind of this region right here will be the supraorbital margin. This is the squamous part of the bone. The orbital parts obviously kind of this portion here. And then this is going to be the supraorbital margin. You can kind of think of those as the, around where we would consider the brow ridges. And then as part of um, the supraorbital margin, you will have either a notch or a foramen. And in the case of this particular donor, you actually have both. You have one supraorbital foramen and one supraorbital notch. And um, you could have one of each or uh, both a, fora a foramen on both sides or notches on both sides. But uh, what is going to actually move through this region is the supraorbital neurovasculature. 
And you'll talk a little bit more about that. Superorbital nerve is going to play a role in terms of cutaneous innervation or sensory innervation of the skin that would surround this particular region. All right, moving, um, now we're moving a bit more posterior lateral and we are going to have the paired parietal bones. So we have two here. We only can see one here. We're looking at the right parietal bone. You don't need to worry about uh, in a practical setting telling me the difference between the rights and the lefts. So I'm just kind of putting that here um, just to kind of get, get an idea of what side we're looking at. So you would have a left parietal bone on the opposite side because we're looking at a lateral view here. And these are kind of the walls of the neurocranium. These are very flat bones. They're fairly thin bones, particularly in comparison to some of the other ones, uh, specifically that occipital bone. Two of um, kind of the, the more prominent things on the parietal bones um, that you will see are the superior and the inferior temporal lines. And these are slight ridges of bones. Um, that's where you see the word lines here. That's an indicative of um, ridges of bone that aren't as prominent as some of the processes that you see in other areas. And these are attachment sites. Um, of the temporal fascia when we're talking about the superior temporal line and your temporalis muscle. So if you kind of put your hands on the side of your head, kind of right behind your orbit and kind of clench your jaw, you can feel a muscle right there. And that's your temporalis muscle. So it's going to have an attachment all the way up here and will eventually uh, have a more distal attachment on the mandible because that this is a muscle of mastication or chewing. Okay, my um, one of my top two favorite bones, it's a toss-up with the sphenoid, are the temporal bones. And you do have two temporal bones. You have a right and a left temporal bone, and you can see just how oddly shaped the temporal bone is. Um, this would be the parietal bone right here, so it'll be inferior to those parietal bones. So you'll have a right and a left. You will also have a fairly prominent part of the temporal bone that you can see um, in the superior view of the, the, base of the, uh, the base of the cranium. And you can even see the temporal bone shaded here in blue in an inferior view. So if you're kind of tip the cranium over and look at the bottom of it, that's what we're looking at here. One of the, the more prominent things when you're looking at a lateral view of the temporal bone are, is the zygomatic process. So you, this right here is the zygomatic process. It will extend. This is the zygomatic bone. So it's kind of doing exactly what it says. It's a process that's heading towards the zygomatic bone. You'll actually have a temporal process right here. And if you put those two together, we call this whole area right here the zygomatic arch. And this is important in terms of a muscle attachment site for the masseter or the masseter muscle, which is another muscle of mastication. You can actually palpate um, your zygomatic process if you kind of go to the inferior part of your orbit and move laterally and posteriorly from there. So you can kind of uh, palpate that anterior to your ear. It's that bump right there. On that zygomatic process, you'll have this inferior projection. This one you can't palpate so much. Um, but this is an inferior projection just anterior to the ear and anterior to the mandibular fossa called the articular tubercle. And it's not a very prominent feature, but what is very important about this, and we'll talk about it when we talk about the temporomandibular joint, is that if you have a dislocation of that joint, um, the condyle of the mandible, which would typically sit kind of right in this region, will actually move anterior to the uh, articular tubercle and kind of lock in place uh, quite often with dislocations. So this little bitty um, projection right here um, actually has some pretty important clinical considerations that we'll, we'll bring back up when we get to our discussion of the joints. Okay, what is this huge hole in the side of the head? Well, this is what we call the external acoustic meatus. Actually, this is what we're looking at right here is the external acoustic opening leading into the meatus. Remember, meatus means passageway or kind of a tunnel. And what is happening here is the ear 
the, the cartilage and everything associated with the ear would be sitting just um, superficial to this area. And this meatus or this tunnel will allow sound waves to reach the tympanic membrane. And you may or may not have heard tympanic membrane before. You, I'm sure, have heard the colloquial term for tympanic membrane. Any idea what that could be? If you think about, well, it's going to kind of allow sound waves to reach the tympanic membrane. So we think, kind of should be thinking ear. And so the tympanic me uh, membrane is colloquially referred to as the eardrum. So once you get to the eardrum and you move medial to that, then you're in the middle ear. And we'll come back to that middle ear region in a bit more detail uh, in a few moments because it's actually middle and inner ear actually within the temporal bone. But before we do that, let's return back to this lateral view. And we have two main projections here that I want to talk about are processes. One is going to be very thin and stylus shaped. Kind of see that right there in its name. This is an inferior projection. You can't really palpate this one very well. And, but it is um, going to be an attachment point for muscles and ligaments of both the tongue as well as the neck. You will have um, some of the ligaments associated with the temporomandibular joint around this region as well. So this process is there because of these attachment points, which will create the, the, uh, the process or kind of form the shape of it. Whereas just posterior to it, so here's that styloid process again, you see this much larger process called the mastoid process. Mastoid means breast-shaped. And if you kind of put your hand just underneath, kind of posterior and inferior to your ear, you should feel a bump there. And that bump is this mastoid process. And it's actually going to be the superior attachment site for your sternocleidomastoid. It has it right there in its name, muscle, which is that... We'll talk about that in a bit more detail when we get to the neck, but it's going to be this large rope-like muscle right, right in your neck. Another interesting thing about the mastoid process is that it contains mastoid air cells, which are basically just these, um, these open areas within the bone. Um, if you've ever th heard of sinuses or paranasal sinuses, that kind of goes in hand with these air cells, and we'll come back to this image um, uh, when we do talk about those paranasal sinuses, but you will have these air cells in this region. So these kind of open areas of bone and these air cells can inflame or um, they can kind of swell and it could be caused due to middle ear infection spreading into the air cells. That's called mastoiditis. Um, this isn't the only cause of mastoiditis, but it's one of the more common ones. Okay, in the inferior view, we're still talking about the temporal bone. Recall that temporal bone is going to be around this region here. Can I keep going this away? Anyway, so it, what I want you to focus on here in this inferior view is this smooth kind of divot right here. And this is called the mandibular fossa. Anytime you have this really kind of smooth area, um, it could be indicative of something attaching there, um, but a lot of times, and in the case of the mandibular fossa, it's actually kind of where the TMJ formed or where a joint would form. And we'll talk about, we talked about synovial joints in that articular cartilage. It, that's one of the reasons why it's so smooth right there is that um, the articular cartilage sat there during life making the area smooth. So this is where the condyle of the mandible will actually articulate with uh, the temporal bone. So this is kind of the T in TMJ. All right, moving back to this view of the base of the cranium. So we're looking into uh, the internal part of the base of the cranium. And this is where I think the temporal bone really gets interesting. And you can see kind of this really dominant rock like very kind of a robust area of bone that looks kind of built up and um, this is called the petrous part uh, right at the top here is the apex of the petrous part of the temporal bone and what is so neat about this 
is that the reason that it is so robust and so built up is because it's actually protecting some very important things that are actually internal to the bone. And this is the middle and the inner ear. And so it is super neat to think about the fact that you actually have some bones within a bone. So in the case of your ear ossicles, which are your smallest bones of the body, these are actually located within the temporal bone, which I just think is so super neat. Bone within bone. How cool can that be? So you do have um, pairs of three types of ear ossicles. The malleus will be the most lateral, the incus will be intermediate, and the stapes, this little thing right here, has the honor of being the smallest bone of the body, um, give or take some sesamoid bones, but really I think it's pretty hard to get much smaller than the stapes. And this is going to be the most medial of the ear ossicles and this is the one that's going to sit in what's called the oval window and the oval window is kind of the last part of the middle ear before you get into the inner ear so where you get to the cochlea and all those semicircular canals um, but all of this is within that temporal bone okay so back to that petrous part and it, this is a difficult to thing to see, so I'll admit that this isn't easy to see, but kind of on the side, just inferior to that apex, you'll have um, an opening referred to as the internal acoustic opening that leads into the meatus. So this is also leading into the middle and inner ear regions. And what this is going to do is transmit two cranial nerves. You'll have the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven, which will enter into the internal acoustic meatus, but the facial nerve will actually end up exiting um, the, the temporal bone and eventually actually exit the, the skull, whereas the vestibulocochlear nerve will enter into the internal acoustic meatus and never leave because really the role of the vestibulocochlear nerve is dominant in terms of the inner ear, in terms of equilibrium and hearing. You can kind of see that in its name right there. All right, this is my all-time favorite foramen, and it is called the jugular foramen. Look how oddly shaped this thing is. It has got a character of its own. The jugular foramen, I have it here with the temporal bone, but it's actually between the temporal bone and the occipital bone. And it is irregularly shaped because bone will form around neurovasculature. So the shape of the neurovasculature will dictate the size and the shape of the foramina. So the internal jugular vein, which will have to deal with the venous pressure of the internal jugular vein, is really why we have this interesting shape of the jugular foramina. So uh, at this point, I'll, you'll have venous sinuses that are going to drain the brain and the surrounding areas. And once you get past the jugular foramen, then it becomes the internal jugular vein. You'll also have three cranial nerves that will traverse this region. You'll have cranial nerve 9, or the glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve 10, or the vagus. The vagus you're going to be talking about so much during the course because it is, it is the wanderer. It makes its way eventually all the way down to the gastrointestinal system. And lastly, the accessory nerve, or cranial nerve 11. Sometimes you hear this referred to as the spinal accessory nerve. All right, the occipital bone. The occipital bone, think the back of the head. So if you're kind of feeling the back of your head, you're feeling around where the occipital bone is. You can see it from the space of the cranium view as well. So here's that temporal bones again. And frontal bone, which we know. You can see a bit of the parietal bones. And then we're going to add occipital bone to our knowledge here. You can also see that it forms quite a bit of the inferior view of the cranium. And uh, it is unpaired, so you only have one occipital bone. Now, while you're feeling the back of your head to kind of get an idea of where your occipital bone is, you may feel a prominent kind of bump or projection on that posterior surface. And this is usually quite palpable. Uh, some individuals, you can even see if the, the haircut is particularly short, 
in that area, you can see where the external occipital protuberance would be. And this is the attachment site for the trapezius muscle, which is a very large superficial muscle of the back. One of the most prominent things of the whole skull, but certainly of the occipital bone, is the foramen magnum. And this just means this big hole. It's actually not the biggest foramen of the body. Your two biggest foramen will actually be associated with your hip bones. But it's on up there. I think it may be the second largest. And the foramen magnum is where you have the transition from the brainstem into the spinal cord. So that is where that transition occurs. You'll also have the vertebral arteries enter into the foramen magnum um, all the way from the subclavian vein in the root of the neck. So this vertebral artery is going to be one of the main arterial supplies of the brain. And you'll also have the accessory nerve. But wait, I just told you the accessory nerve is going to go through the jugular foramen. And it absolutely does. The accessory nerve uh, traditionally was referred to as the spinal accessory nerve because it, even though it's a cranial nerve, actually, or is considered a cranial nerve, is actually going to um, have its origin in the spinal cord. So it will come off of the most proximal portions of the spinal cord. It will ascend through the foramen magnum to get into the skull and will eventually make its way almost immediately back out through the jugular foramen. Now we're looking at an inferior view. There's that foramen magnum again. I always kind of go back to the foramen magnum when I'm getting confused about certain areas because it kind of that's so obvious something that I can locate really quickly and kind of help me get organized with some of the, the little bit more difficult things to identify. And there are two smooth areas of bone kind of on either side of the foramen magnum and these were referred to as the occipital condyles and these condyles are going to articulate with the first cervical vertebrae so this is how you're going to have that vertebral column articulating with the skull or the cranium and this is called the atlanto occipital joint um, that C1 is sometimes referred to as the atlas, and we'll talk about that and actually look at it in upcoming uh, videos. But you think of atlas holding the world on his shoulders, um, that's where the name comes from. Okay, here's my, you know, on up there in terms of favorite bones. There was the temporal bone, and the sphenoid bone is on up there as well. And it is this kind of, I think, beautifully shaped kind of butterfly shaped bone that you can see in all kinds of different areas. You can see it in the basal cranium and we'll come back to that uh, on the actual uh, donors or on the dry bone. You can see that you can see some of it inferiorly and then you can even see it from kind of an external view forming a little bit of this region right here. There are a lot of foramina associated with the sphenoid bone. Um, and one thing I forgot to note, if, and you can kind of see this here, is that there are on, there's only one sphenoid bone. So it's not a paired bone. It's this kind of oddly shaped bone kind of right in the middle there. So, so back to the fact that there are a lot of foramina associated with the sphenoid bone. So a lot of the neurovasculature of, um, associated with the brain are going to kind of exit through this region and occasionally you'll have things entering into the region but for the most part things are kind of exiting from the brain in terms of these cranial nerves. So starting kind of more anteriorly and we'll work our way posteriorly you'll have these two optic canals which is the means by which the optic nerve or cranial nerve 2 will uh, exit the this region, uh, so kind of from the brain region, and head towards the orbit, because if I were to remove this bone right here, I'd actually be looking into the orbit region. Also the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery, this is also going to move through this canal in order to enter the orbit. This region right here, this kind of saddle-shaped region, is the hypophyseal fossa, and you'll either see it with an E or an I. Don't worry so much about that. 
Um, what I really rather you understand is this is where the pituitary gland sits during life. Pituitary gland is hugely important in terms of a lot of the growth processes. And so it's going to kind of, uh, from the brain, kind of be sitting right in this region. So hugely protected in terms of uh, bony protection. All right. Now we're getting into... Uh, kind of the ones that go boom, 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 kind of right in a row. So you're going to have a superior orbital fissure, which is going to be right under this lesser wing of the sphenoid. And this is a very large um, opening in terms of the skull. It will lead into the orbit, and that's kind of key. Um, and you have it right here in the name. It's leading into the orbit, so a lot of so all this... Uh, all these nerves that I have listed here are all making their way to the orbit. So you'll have oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, abducens. These are all going to innervate the extraocular eye muscles. And then you'll also have the sensory innervation for that region, which is the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. And trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve 5. It is the largest cranial nerve, and it will be divided into three parts or three divisions. So that's what this indicates here. This is the first division. This would be the second division. This would be the third division. So these other foramina, foramen rotundum, which is this nice almost perfect circle, is the means by which the maxillary division or the second division of the trigeminal exits. And then the foramen ovale, which is more oval shaped as its name would suggest, is how the largest division of the trigeminal nerve, or V3, or the mandibular division, will exit the skull. And so I have these uh, underlined and bolded to kind of go with this mnemonic standing room only. So superior orbital fissure will allow V1 to exit, foramen rotundum V2, and foramen ovale V3. Then kind of right next to, kind of posterior lateral, you'll have an itty bitty almost pinprick of a foramen, which is the foramen spinosum. And this is how the middle meningeal artery will enter into the skull. And it has right here in its name kind of what it's going to supply, which are the meninges, which are going to be this um, covering of the brain that adds this protection in that region. And you'll talk a bit more about that with Dr. Sullivan, the meninges, but you need supply to, to those regions. And so this is how um, the means by which the artery moves into the skull and to supply the meninges. All right, last but not least for this video in the neurocranium, we're going to have the ethmoid bone. And, you know, I don't know why this one isn't higher up on my list, because just look how neat, neato it looks. It is super oddly shaped. There is a lot going on in this region. Um, this, if you recall, is the frontal bone. Sphenoid would be right here. So it's going to be a bit more anteriorly placed. And you can see, if you're looking at this bone, the shaded in bone, which is the ethmoid, you see all these dots kind of all over the place. And these these indicate spaces, which are these cribriform foramen, cribriform foramina, if I could say it correctly. Um, and so cribra, uh, cribri means sieve-like. So you're going to have, it basically looks like all these little bitty openings. And these are the ways by which the axons of the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve one, will kind of enter and kind of traverse the, the region. So kind of from the nasal mucosa uh, back to the brain. So the olfactory nerve, think the sense of smell. Okay, so that was a lot of bone fun. Now keep in mind that while we are introducing this here and um, we're talking about some of the structures that attach or kind of move through the foramina, these names will come back uh, up over and over throughout the course. So you'll talk again with about the cranial nerves with Dr. Sullivan and talk a little bit more about the functions. We'll talk a little bit about it again when we're in the, um, the laboratory videos where we're kind of breaking down the structures and how we're going to identify them. So just take your time with this. It's a, it is a lot of content, but you'll hear it in a few different ways and I think it'll start to sink in. So let's take a moment and
think uh, through a question together. Which structure of the temporal bone has air cells within? Is it the articular tubercle? Is it the internal acoustic meatus? C, mandibular fossa? D, mastoid process? Or E, styloid process? So pause the video if you need to. And when you're done, let's kind of go through the stem together. So the first thing that kind of jumps out at me is I need to be thinking about the temporal bone. But if you look at these five structures, you're like, eh, that's not very helpful because these are all temporal bone structures. So let's keep going. Air cells within. Okay, we talked about those air cells. Those are those openings within the bone. Um, they're kind of like the paranasal sinuses, uh, which we'll, we'll get into a bit more detail, but basically they, there can be inflammation in those regions. And really only one of these should kind of stick out as the correct answer, which is the mastoid process. The mastoid process, if you recall, if you kind of palpate underneath your ear, you'd be feeling a bump and that's at your mastoid process there. It's actually kind of filled with all these uh, air cells that are going to uh, be in very close association with the ear. And so sometimes if you have an infection of the middle ear, yeah, that infection can make its way to the air cells, causing mastoiditis. All right. Thank you for your time. And then we are, I'll see you again in the next video regarding the vis uh, viscerocranium or the facial skeleton. Thanks for your time and attention. Have a great day.